Walter Russell's periodic table that he put together. Now you will compare that to Mendeleev's periodic table. You'll compare Walter Russell's to it, and you'll see something completely different. It's unwinding. Whoa. If you've also wondered what Terence Howard was talking about regarding the periodic table of elements, suggesting that it's incorrect and instead advocating for Walter Russell's complete version, this video will dive deep into Walter Russell's writings and papers. Please bear in mind that when Russell presented his work to Nikola Tesla, Tesla suggested hiding this information for 1,000 years because humanity was not ready for it. Thus, Terence could be one of those geniuses we only truly appreciate after their time. A recognition not yet realized. Before we delve into Walter Russell's writings and his 10 octave cycle of elements of matter, let's first set the stage with some insights from Terence himself. You'll see hydrogen sitting all the way over there by itself, but they don't show that hydrogen has the same tone as, as carbon. Same tone, same key of E. 40.5 hertz, the next one would be like 81 hertz, you go to silicone, it will double up and would be 162 hertz. You'll go to cobalt and it'll be 324 hertz. It's in that base if you were to take the angles of incidence or the tones that they create, you know, their color. Like you can turn color back into sound. It's the same wavelength, it's just twice as long or much longer. So all you have to do is keep dividing light by two and you'll ultimately get back to the audible sound of it because there was a relationship between light and color, sound and tone, matter and shape. Walter Russell's periodic table that he put together, now you compare that to Mendeleev's periodic table, you'll compare Walter Russell's to it and you'll see something completely different. It's unwinding. You'll see there's a relationship between hydrogen, carbon, silicone, cobalt, rhodium. They're all bonded, they're all sit be as the middle point between two noble gases. So those things don't really exist. It's only one substance. Now the problem is, the first thing that we're able to perceive is hydrogen. That's the first visible element because before it is too dense for us to perceive it. But as you reach into the next octave, the carbon octave, and they call that a bisexual tone because the carbon has two tones to it. It has a negative side and a positive side. Part where lithium behaves, lithium is contractive. Beryllium is contractive. Boron is contractive. But the moment you get to carbon, you balance it out. It gets to a perfect balance of plus and minus four. So it's a double tone. Nitrogen is minus three, one. Oxygen is minus two. Fluorine is minus one. Now the balance of this, all of those are mates. Fluorine and lithium naturally mate. If you have lithium bonded with any other element, the moment that fluorine is introduced, it will break all bonds violently so it can bond with fluorine. Same thing with beryllium and oxygen. That's why it's said, and what they've tried to keep from us. If you have, you want to break water into its component parts of hydrogen and oxygen, all you have to do is introduce beryllium or the sound of beryllium. Oxygen will violently break away from any other thing, even hydrogen, to bond with that beryllium. And now you can have, it just if, with the frequency of it, and since the hydrogen is smaller, hydrogen will, that waveform, you can send that up into one tube, the oxygen into another tube, without using electrolysis, without using heat. It was just through frequency and the proof of it, we know the relationship between sodium and chlorine. They're equal and opposite mates. If you get out of the pool and you got chlorine and you're itching from the chlorine, all you have to do is get some real salt and rub that on your skin and it'll turn right into an oil. It naturally neutralizes each other. So everything has an equal and opposite mate. The lithium becomes sodium in the next octave, doubles the same exact tone, just doubled and, and wider. The sodium becomes potassium in the next octave, widens up. The reason that arsenic kills us is because our DNA has nitrogen and it has phosphorus in it because nitrogen unwinds into the next octave right after silicone and becomes phosphorus. Our DNA has both of those in there, but it's going by tone. So the moment arsenic, which sits as a minus three on the next octave, the moment arsenic is introduced, 
the body thinks that, oh, this is my thing that I need. And it tries to wrap itself around the arsenic, but it causes the DNA to unravel because it's four times as large as that nitrogen was. And those other little elements, titanium, vanadium, chromium, magnesium, and, and iron, all of those, those aren't true elements. Those are isotopes. Those things, those first three are the full tones. They make full spheres. But now it becomes elliptical with titanium, vanadium, and chromium. And on the other side, it's like when, like I said, if you wrap the rag around your hand, the first wrap, really tight. You can't get much out of it. Second wrap, damn near can't see the difference of it. Third one, you start, you start seeing hydrogen. The fourth wrap, you see carbon. But in between each one of them, by the time you get, nature does not allow us in the silicone octave for there to expand out. But there is the same titanium, vanadium, chromium, magnesia, and iron that exists between aluminum and silicone. But nature doesn't allow us to unravel that. But now, with the wave conjugations, we can. We couldn't do that before because we didn't know the angles of incidence that were necessary to open these things up. And you couldn't do that with the platonic solids because the platonic solids were averages and approximations. After listening to Terence's insights on Walter Russell, let's now explore Russell's own writings to fully understand his innovative ideas. Imagine the universe as a grand piano, where each key represents a different element of matter. Now, instead of producing a sound, each key represents a step in the creation and transformation of matter. The 10 octave cycle Russell speaks of is akin to playing from the lowest to the highest note on this cosmic piano. Russell begins with a striking statement. The 10 octave cycle begins and ends with an absolute equalization of all dimensions of motion. Its beginning is its ending. What does he mean by this? Simply put, the cycle forms a loop where it ends. It seamlessly begins again. This reflects the continuous, eternal nature of creation. There is no definitive start or end. Everything is in a perpetual state of transformation and recurrence. As we delve deeper, Russell mentions, at the beginning of the cycle, time dimension, which is then preponderant, transfers its state of motion into power dimension. Here, think of time dimension as the duration or longevity of energy within a certain state. This time energy gradually converts into power dimension, the strength or intensity of energy. It's like winding up a toy. The longer you wind, time, the more power the toy has when released. This transformation is not a one-time shift, but a continuous, spasmodic process throughout each octave. Each step, or octave, can be seen as an individual cycle of inhaling and exhaling. Just as we breathe in, inhale, and out, exhale. Each octave involves a similar rhythmic exchange between accumulating energy and releasing it. A key moment in the cycle is the element of carbon, located at the fifth octave. Russell describes carbon as the endothermic dividing line of the cycle, marking the midpoint where the cycle's inhalation switches to exhalation. Carbon's unique properties, such as its hardness, high melting point, and crystalline structure, symbolize the peak of energy integration within the cycle. From carbon onward, the cycle begins its shift from accumulating power back to expanding time dimensions, leading to increased radioactive emanations, energy that's not just stored, but actively dispersing. Russell further anthropomorphizes the octaves by associating them with genders. The first five octaves are described as male, or electropositive, characterized by their generative, energy accumulating nature. In contrast, the second set of five octaves are female or electronegative, focusing more on energy release and expansion. To make this even more relatable, Russell likens the first five octaves to the stages of human growth from birth through youth, mirroring the increasing strength and complexity of an evolving idea, or in this case, the progressive complexity of matter. In Walter Russell's The Universal One, Page 126 provides an intriguing exploration of the 10 octave cycle of elements, blending scientific insight with philosophical depth. Russell begins by conceptualizing the universe as undergoing a cyclic journey through 10 octaves, each representing a different phase in the transformation and progression of matter. This cycle, much like a loop, 
begins and ends at a point of absolute equilibrium, where all motions, whether kinetic, potential, or thermal, are perfectly balanced. As you can see in the illustration, the cyclical nature underscores the continuity of creation. There is neither a true beginning nor an ending, just an everlasting process of transformation. Focusing on the dynamics within these octaves, Russell explains how the predominant dimension of motion shifts from time to power. Initially, the time dimension, think of it as the rate or speed of energetic processes, is dominant. This is depicted in the early phases of the cycle in the illustration, where the flow of time is visually represented, perhaps through spiraling patterns or flowing lines that gradually condense into more solid forms as they transition into the power dimension. The concept of high power is accumulated time suggests a fascinating transformation where the continuous passage of time, with its slow deceleration, accumulates into a significant store of energy. This energy, or power, is what drives the universe through its phases. The illustration might show this accumulation as a gradual thickening or intensifying of colors or textures along the cycle's progression, visually representing the increase in energy density. At the heart of this cycle is carbon, situated in the fifth octave, serving as a critical pivot point. Carbon marks the shift from an endothermic, energy-absorbing phase to an exothermic, energy-releasing phase. In the illustration, this might be emphasized by a distinct change in color or pattern, highlighting carbon's unique position as the point where the cycle's inhalation of energy gives way to an exhalation. Carbon's properties, its hardness, high melting point, and perfect crystallization are manifestations of its role at this maximum orbital velocity, the point of highest energy integration within the cycle. Russell describes the last five octaves in the cycle as a phase of decline, leading to what he metaphorically refers to as the death of the elements. This is not the end, but rather a transformation where death in this cycle merely leads to a new beginning or life. Here, the cycle is seen as a continuous loop. What dies, in a metaphorical sense, gives rise to new forms, akin to the phoenix rising from its ashes. Each idea or element within the mind evolves and devolves following a specific formula. This formula encapsulates the transformation of energy states from time, speed, to power, potential energy, and back. This is the law of growth, as Russell calls it and it underscores the periodic nature of what we observe as life and death. These are not two distinct states, but part of a continuum, where life is an expression of accumulating energy, centripetal force, and death is the release of that energy, centrifugal force. At the cycle's beginning, motion is at its maximum speed, but minimum in terms of power. This can be visualized as a state where energy is being expended rapidly, without yet having accumulated substantial force. Over time, as Russell explains, the speed decelerates, accumulating into potential energy, much like a spring that compresses, storing more energy as it is pushed further. Russell employs a vivid analogy to illustrate these concepts, a mountain brook flowing down into a reservoir. This brook represents a constant flow of energy at low potential, swiftly moving and performing minimal work. As it falls into the reservoir, it accumulates potential by storing water akin to storing time. The reservoir, with its stored potential, can unleash significant power, capable of laying low forests or wiping out towns, mirroring the destructive potential of released energy. This brook and reservoir metaphor beautifully encapsulates how small, consistent inputs of energy can accumulate over time into a powerful force, much like the elements in the 10 octave cycle, accumulating energy across different states. Russell ties these observations back to the concept of the thinking mind, the source of all energy in the universe. The power we observe, whether in a flowing stream or in the elemental forces of the universe, stems from this singular source. The variations we see, the different elements across the octaves, are merely different manifestations of this energy, determined by how much time has been converted into power. Walter Russell's The Universal One presents a sophisticated model known as the 10-octave cycle of elements. 
which details the progression and transformation of matter across various energetic states. This cycle begins with the simplest forms of matter and progresses through stages of increasing complexity before ultimately returning to simplicity, albeit at a higher energetic state, reflecting a cyclical and eternal process of creation and dissolution. The cycle starts with elements in their most basic forms, akin to hydrogen, characterized by their simplicity and foundational properties. As the cycle progresses, elements evolve, becoming more complex and varied in their chemical and physical behaviors. By the time we reach the middle octaves, elements like carbon appear, marking a significant turning point. Carbon, situated in the fifth octave, embodies a shift from energy accumulation to energy release. It is at this juncture where the accumulated potential energy begins to dissipate, showcasing carbon's unique role in balancing the forces within the cycle. Moving into the higher octaves, the elements exhibit increased instability and radioactivity, indicative of the cycle's progression towards the release of previously accumulated energy. This part of the cycle highlights elements that are unstable and highly radioactive, such as uranium and plutonium, which play crucial roles in nuclear physics and energy applications. As the cycle nears completion, it returns to simpler elemental forms. However, these elements are now at a higher level of energy release, representing a cosmic exhalation after the inhalation of energy in the earlier phases. This end stage mirrors the beginning, yet at a more evolved energetic state emphasizing the continuous and eternal nature of creation, where each ending is a prelude to a new beginning. Russell's integration of life and death into the cycle is particularly notable. He views these not as binary opposites, but as interconnected phases of a continuous process. Life is associated with the accumulation and compaction of energy through centripetal forces, while death corresponds to the release and dissipation of this energy through centrifugal forces. This perspective challenges conventional views and encourages seeing the universe as a dynamic continuum of energy transformation. Whether or not we fully understand or accept Russell's ideas, they challenge us to think deeper about the nature of reality and our place within it. Russell's theories encourage a holistic view of the universe, where mind, matter, and energy are intricately linked. This perspective invites us to explore the profound unity underlying all physical and metaphysical phenomena. Stay curious and keep exploring the wonders of the universe.